some investment themes are more exciting than others. Recently, themes like crypto and blockchain, marijuana, psychedelics, cloud computing, electric vehicles, clean energy, robotics, and artificial intelligence have caught the imaginations of investors. But this isn't the first time that investors have clamored over exciting companies. Electronics in the 60s, the Nifty 50 in the 70s, biotech in the 80s, and the internet stocks in the 90s are good examples. Similar examples go back hundreds of years. The idea behind these eye-catching investment themes is that investors can participate in potentially disruptive trends or innovations to earn excess returns. As S&P describes their thematic indexes, they offer access to a series of technologically enabled, often disruptive industries, generally referred to in aggregate as the fourth industrial revolution. I'm Ben Felix, portfolio manager at PWL Capital. I'm going to tell you why thematic investing is like lighting your money on fire. If you're excited about an investment, it's probably not a good investment. The collective excitement of investors has a tendency to drive up stock prices. Few things are as exciting as new technologies or industries. I used to read about hyped up investment crazes in books, but in my relatively short tenure as a portfolio manager, I have witnessed the phenomenon firsthand. Do you remember marijuana stocks? Everyone was going to be rich, until they weren't. One of the big challenges with exciting industries is that they're exciting. When people see a big potential market, lots of businesses will form to meet the potential demand. The excitement about a big market stems from profit opportunities for businesses, but however large the expected profits from a new investment theme may be, what matters to investors is growth in earnings per share. If lots of shares are issued by new and existing companies pursuing profit opportunities related to an investment theme, it is possible that the investment theme will end up underperforming the market. This idea was formalized in a 2003 paper by William Bernstein and Rob Arnott titled Earning Growth, the 2% Dilution. Even if there is a huge pile of potential earnings up for grabs based on a new technology, the growth in earnings per share of companies pursuing it may not be attractive. Most entrepreneurs and investors don't think like this, though. Entrepreneurs starting businesses in big markets expect to be successful, and investors selecting companies to invest in in big markets expect to pick winners. The combination can drive up the prices of companies pursuing a hot investment theme. Eventually, as investors learn more about the market and the level of competition, prices tend to fall, and they often fall dramatically. This dynamic of big markets creating high prices for companies despite limited opportunity for investment returns, followed by a drop in prices when reality sets in, was described in a 2020 article by Brad Cornell and Aswath Damodaran titled The Big Market Delusion, Valuation and Investment Implications. They explain that the extent of overpricing in a market will depend on the degree of overconfidence exhibited by entrepreneurs and investors, where more overconfidence leads to higher prices, the potential size of the market, where a larger potential market leads to higher prices, the degree of uncertainty about the future profitability of the market, where greater uncertainty leads to higher prices due to an amplification of the overconfidence effect, and the perception of winner-take-all markets, again, amplifying the effect of overconfidence on prices. Cornell and Demotoran offer empirical examples of e-commerce in the 1990s, the online advertising industry from 2015 to 2020, and cannabis stocks in 2018. These were all big potential markets with intense competition, extremely high stock prices, and an eventual sobering drop in prices. The effect of overconfidence on asset prices is thoroughly documented in a 2003 paper by Jose Shankman and Wei Jiang titled Overconfidence and Speculative Bubbles. The authors explain that due to the costs of short selling, overconfident investors will tend to have more of an impact on prices than pessimistic ones. And overconfident investors will be willing to pay more than their own assessment of a stock's fundamental value to acquire it because it gives them the option to sell to an even more overconfident investor later. The result is bubble-like behavior in asset prices, which doesn't tend to end well for investors. This is a real problem, especially for naive investors with limited knowledge about asset pricing. In a related 2013 lecture, Shankman explains experts that wish to signal their familiarity with new technologies have a tendency to exaggerate their value and in this way generate over-optimism among naive investors. That over-optimism among naive investors is something that financial product providers are more than happy to cash in on. A 2021 paper by Itzhak Ben David and three co-authors titled Competition for Attention in the ETF Space finds that specialized ETFs, which are typically concentrated portfolios with relatively high fees focused on trendy themes, are launched just after the peak of excitement and often the peak of returns, 
related to popular investment themes. They find that specialized ETFs do not create value for investors on average, delivering a negative four-factor annual alpha of about 6% on average in the five years after inception of the fund. Before the fund inception, the authors find that the indexes used to create these specialized index funds tend to have very positive performance. This makes sense economically. <laughs> for the fund provider, create an index based on a popular theme with recent high past returns, build an ETF to track that index, profit. Unfortunately for investors, these specialized funds tend to hold securities with low expected returns. Leading up to the thematic ETF launches, the securities in the indexes tend to have been increasing in relative price measured by book to market and media sentiment. But pre-launch, these indexes are not investable. They are back-tested conceptions that index manufacturers think will sell. After the ETF launches and the index becomes investable, the stock valuations tend to come back to earth and the media sentiment tends to decline. Thematic indexes also tend to contain stocks with more positive skewness, which would be appealing for investors who have a preference for lottery-like payoffs. They find that within specialized ETFs, the ones holding stocks with the highest pre-launch returns and media sentiment perform the worst post-launch, further supporting the idea that the issuance of specialized ETFs occurs near the peak of valuation of the underlying securities. Now, surely, investors in these funds don't think they're going to lose money by investing. The authors use analyst forecasts as a proxy for investor expectations. They find that portfolios of specialized stocks display significantly higher long-term growth forecasts in the period leading up to the ETF launch. After launch, the stocks experience a downward revision in growth expectations. The forecast errors, measured by the realized earnings per share minus the analyst long-term growth forecast at the time of launch for specialized ETFs, become significantly negative and economically large. This is consistent with strong over-optimism in expectations around the time of launch. These data support the hypothesis that the providers of thematic ETFs launch products based on themes where investors hold optimistic beliefs. Thematic indexes on which thematic ETFs are based consist of high-priced stocks with strong media sentiment and optimistic analyst forecasts, all of which tend to decline around the time that the ETF tracking the index launches and investors can actually start putting their money in. A question worth exploring further is what risk factors thematic ETFs offer exposure to. There are well-documented risk factors that explain the majority of differences in returns between diversified portfolios. How do thematic ETFs stack up? In Betting Against Quant, examining the factor exposures of thematic indexes, David Blitz digs into the question using major index providers MSCI and S&P's thematic indexes as a sample. Blitz finds that thematic indexes tend to have lots of idiosyncratic risk measured by their volatility ratio, that is risk that could be diversified away. And they tend to be tilted towards small cap stocks with high prices, weak profitability, and aggressive investment. Empirically, this combination of risk factors is terrible, delivering the worst risk-adjusted returns of any factor-based portfolio sort. Why would anyone invest in these funds? Blitz offers some ideas. Investors in these funds may simply not believe in factor models for expected returns. For example, any investor who believes that value investing is old news would have less of an issue holding small cap growth stocks. In other words, these investors may not believe in asset pricing models. The other possibility is that these relatively concentrated portfolios are delivering positive risk-adjusted returns, or alpha. Despite their terrible expected return profiles, Thematic indexes may still be delivering positive returns that are unexplained by a factor model. In reality, while thematic indexes do have positive alphas in back tests, live funds, once launched, tend to have negative alphas, as we saw earlier. Another possibility is that some investors may want the lottery-like payoff of specialized indexes if they have high conviction in a given theme. Who cares about expected returns if you're just making a thematic bet that the market has underpriced a certain theme? As we would expect with lottery-like payoffs, these will be losing bets on average, but winners could be big. Or maybe investors are simply behaving irrationally, chasing past returns and attention-grabbing investment themes, as they tend to do. This behavior is well-documented in 2007 and 2020 papers by Brad Barber and Terence O'Dean, among many others. A final possibility is that there are non-financial benefits to owning the stocks in thematic indexes. Things like a need to belong, Feeling good about the investment or satisfying a need for thrill-seeking are all documented reasons that people choose to own assets separate from their financial benefits. 
I can definitely see this for things like clean energy or even ARC, where investors form a community around their investment. The title of this paper, Betting Against Quant, Examining the Factor Exposures of Thematic Indexes, is alluding to the fact that quantitative investors are often investing in stocks with low prices, robust profitability, and conservative investment. Investing this way can be done systematically at a low cost and has theoretically sound and empirically persistent positive expected returns in excess of the market. To build these portfolios, quant investors need someone else to overweight the small cap growth, low profitability, high investment stocks, since all stocks in the market need to be owned. It seems like thematic investors may be taking this junk off the hands of quant investors. Regardless of their financial performance, another big hurdle for investors is their own behavior. In Morningstar's 2021 Mind the Gap report, which compares the return of funds to the return of the investors in those funds, which are affected by the timing of their cash flows, one of the biggest behavior gaps is for sector funds. Morningstar doesn't categorize thematic funds in this report, but I would be comfortable betting that the behavior gap is even larger. This was particularly problematic for Kathy Wood's flagship ARKK ARK fund, as documented by Morningstar. At the end of November 2021, ARC Innovation had delivered a staggering five-year compound return of 41.3%, but the average ARC investor had earned only 9.9%, not to mention the absolute collapse since then. I tried to warn you guys. Fund companies have a huge incentive to create and market products that cater to attention-grabbing investment themes. The fees on thematic ETFs are a lot higher than on broad market ETFs. Take Kathy Wood's ARC Innovation ETF, which has a fee of 0.75%, or the Horizons Marijuana Life Sciences Index ETF with a management fee of 0.75% and a management expense ratio, including other costs, of 0.85%. This is way more expensive than a broad market ETF, or even a small cap value or value ETF. It is good business for ETF providers to ride these trends. But for investors, jumping on thematic bandwagons is one of the worst approaches to investing money both in the short run, unless you get lucky, and definitely in the long run. Thanks for watching. I'm Ben Felix, Portfolio Manager at PWL Capital. If you enjoyed this video, please share it with someone who you think could benefit from the information. We also discussed this topic in episode 185 of the Rational Reminder podcast. Hi.